Alrighty, we are live again. Sorry guys, we're a few minutes late. Uh, I got held up trying to make featured images and grab a couple extra clips at the last minute, so I apologize. Pretty eventful Friday or not so eventful Friday? It's been the same for me, but uh, I noticed you put our entire household at risk by leaving the house and disobeying current government orders. That's... I thought they said we could go to the beach now. No, not that, yet. That's on Tuesday? Yeah. Oh, so I have to wait four days? But you didn't, did you? I went to the beach. Yeah. But you know what? I didn't come in contact with anybody. That's not, that's not what matters. What matters? The, what matters is that you do what you're told. I have never told you you can't go kiteboard. I've never said that. Well, why haven't you guys been to the beach until now? Like... Because Kristen's felt like she didn't want to break rules, and now suddenly I think the, uh, the insanity of being locked in has taken over, and even she is like, I'm ready to get out of the house. Right. So we... So people can only take so much. Man, we had a great day. Like, I got... <laughs> See, now you're happy. You're getting back I got to life. food from Pura Vida. Got a ch fried chicken sandwich. I got a fried fish sandwich. Got some coconut shrimp. Went out to the beach. I had this little pop-up tent. So I can oh, you ate on the beach. Ate on the beach. Oh, wow. There is a lot of sargasm out there, though. Yeah. But uh, it was nice. You should do it. <laughs> I do do it. But you goody two-shoes have been inside this whole time. And then all of a sudden, you're just like, ah, screw the rules. You know what? We're just going to get back to living life. It's um, called being an early adopter. Is that what I am? We both are now. Yeah. Um, let's quickly just look at the numbers here. Um... 5.2 million cases, 339 deaths. And then in the United States here, 1.6 million cases, 97,000 deaths. And uh, I, was talking, I was talking with my dad today, and I, I've been telling you how my, my family, and I would say the majority of people that I know in the States, are not taking it nearly as seriously as everyone that I know here in Puerto Rico. And I think it has to do with just that our lockdown's been so much more hardcore here yeah. that in our minds it's way more serious than people who may have more cases and more deaths, but they haven't been locked down as hard, right? Well, that and if you live here, you know how difficult the medical situation can be. <laughs> so I think true. a lot of us are just like, we don't want to go to the hospitals in Puerto Rico. Whereas in the United States, you probably aren't even thinking about hospital care. You're just like, eh, it's, it's good enough or it's great. Yeah. Maybe if you're in another country, you're like, America's hospital service is horrible. But here in Puerto Rico, it's like, I would rather not go to a hospital ever. Yeah, that could be, that could be the case. I don't know if locals feel the same way, but maybe they do. But um, I was talking to my dad earlier, and uh, he was like, you know, you got you to be safe. But uh, at the same time, you just got to get back to living your life. And uh, your mom and I were going to a restaurant tonight. And I don't think they wear masks. Maybe they have some hand sanitizer in the car, but my mom just goes shopping and just, you know, not for necessity, just whatever yeah. she wants. And uh, my, dad, my dad was just saying that he th thought that, like, oh, you know, we're on, we're on the way out of this. Like, uh, we hit the peak, and, uh, you know, it's drying up, and summer's coming, and, like, this is a thing of the past. And I didn't quite understand why he thought thought that but you know if you just look at the numbers here like yesterday we had 28,000 new cases and of course you could make the argument that we're probably doing more tests than ever before that's one big argument so maybe it's not as clear cut as this but I mean you can go back a long way when we were hitting right around 28,000 cases back at the beginning of April you know what I mean every day Every day, that's true. Because so, I saw an article uh, on Reddit or CNN that was like, yesterday we hit 28,000 new cases. We haven't hit that since the beginning of May. And I was like, have we? And so I go to this website, and you can scroll back. Like on the 13th and the 12th, we hit right at 28. Uh, if you go to the 5th and 4th, there's many days in May that we hit 28,000 new cases. I don't know why they were making it sound like today was such a milestone. Yeah, I, I, I don't... I mean, like, you go go just a few back. Like, there's 27. Right here. 
Yeah, and then yeah. go to May 4th and 5th. Like, most of May was around 28. Yeah. 29. Like, I don't know why today. Like, they were trying to paint this picture of we've reopened and we've hit the highest number. Yeah. But it's like we've hit the highest number in seven days. But then right. some people were also saying that there is this natural oscillation where Sundays we don't report. But then Thursdays and Fridays apparently are typically the highest reported days you know, anyway. Maybe it's like before the weekend they're catching up with old work or something. Yeah, I don't know how that's happening with the reporting, but... So but anyway. you're just saying that it's weird that your parents are psychologically thinking that we're over this, yet the number of cases puts us to, you know, end of March? Yeah. Now, I'm not, I'm not taking the side that we're over this, and I'm not taking the side that, like, this is proof that we're all killing ourselves from coming out of lockdown. It seems like it seems like we're on a, a path that goes up and down every week. And overall, we're slowly going down, but we're not going down as rapidly as I would have expected from being locked inside for two months. So I would certainly expect there to be a massive jump over the course of the next couple of weeks. The other interesting thing, my uh, grandmother's nursing home now has its first case. Mm. Somebody in her building is now in the hospital for COVID. What do you think happened there? Because they, they were believe, very strict. Yeah, they're extremely strict. My parents can't even go visit them. It's one of the healthcare workers. Apparently, it was an outside healthcare worker who was hired individually to come in and like sit with this person or help him throughout the day. Whereas um, maybe in the building, you only get five visits a day or something, but they hired an extra person to stay all day. Yeah. And they're thinking that potentially he did it, but they have no proof. Because so, he's asymptomatic or? Uh, I don't know. Worker? I don't know if they've just had enough time to fully look into it. It might just all be rumors at this point. But my grandmother said that uh, soon, maybe in the next week, I think they're waiting for the virus to maybe metastasize in people. They're going to come through and test every single worker and every single person mm -hmm. in the entire place. So it'll be interesting to see well, what happens with Henry that. Henry McCant says, Montgomery, Alabama is one open ICU bed. I assume that means has one bed left. Did yeah. I hear that Alabama was one of the states that's slowly losing control of their hospitals? Yes. I, I haven't heard have this a, from I my have parents. A clip of this. But um, um, since, since we're talking about it, I could just pull it up. This looks like yesterday's podcast. Oh, that's why I don't see the right files here. Well, I also have some video clips on uh, nursing homes in Florida, so maybe we'll get to that soon. Well, let's watch this Alabama clip here. In Alabama's coronavirus war room, disturbing news that ICU beds at hospitals in the state capitol are full. Right now, if you're from Montgomery and you need an ICU bed, you're in trouble. Tonight, cases in Alabama continue to climb, now more than 13,000. Baptist Health System in Montgomery has 54 patients on ventilators. Doctors at the hospital at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, now on alert to take the overflow. The virus is not gone. The virus is still out there. This is a smart virus that spreads very easily from person to person. Montgomery and the rest of Alabama began reopening 10 days ago, and data from the policy lab at Children's Hospital at Philadelphia predicted it was a spot to watch. You're doing a prediction. It's not 100%, but do people accept what you're predicting? Well, it's sort of like a weather forecast. I mean, you know, we're projecting out four weeks, but it's helpful in guiding you what may happen over the next couple of weeks. The newest Philadelphia model is now forecasting hot spots in Houston, Dallas, and across Tennessee. So, uh, I, you know, That's scary. I, maybe it's scary. It also just seems to be Montgomery, Alabama that's hit. So, you know, that could have just been like a few big parties in a small town or something. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I mean, you know, I'm from Alabama, went to school in Birmingham. I know UAB very well. Um, they're the one with the airport. Montgomery, even though that's the capital, I feel like Montgomery is like a small town. Like, I never went to Montgomery except to go to a mall or something. I feel like if Montgomery is bad, then Birmingham has to be bad too. Birmingham has way more medical facilities, so maybe that's the silver lining here. But, um, my fear would be that people in Alabama do not take this seriously at all. 
Yeah. Uh, most of the state probably views this as a big city problem, as a New York problem, as a coast problem, as a city that's got a huge international airport problem. Maybe they look to Atlanta. Um, I almost put this video in here, but it's kind of sad that uh, our uh, football coach had to come on and say, you need to be wearing masks. So uh, Nick Saban comes out, you know, and people were saying, like, that's more powerful than the governor <laughs> coming out and saying we need to wear masks. But Nick Saban is now weighed in. But I think, you know, the majority of people in the South do not take this seriously. Maybe this is a wake-up call. Did you ever turn on the broadcast on F-Stoppers? That did not go live. No, oh, yeah, it did. It, it did. did. Okay. Um, so let's let's play the the main video today. This is what I thought was the main story. Is what we touched on yesterday, which was that the CDC now says you don't have to worry about surfaces anymore. <laughs> so this doctor gets quizzed about it, and at the beginning, he seems to say, you know, he's being a little reasonable, and then it just is like you don't really have to worry about surfaces anymore. And corrected, let me uh, double down on it for all the families watching who just today use Clorox wipes on uh, whatever groceries uh, that entered their house um, have wiped down surfaces. Are you saying, and this is the tougher part, that some of that has become unnecessarily rigorous? Well, let me just say hand washing is important, and I would continue to emphasize that. As somebody that deals with a lot of infectious diseases, I can tell you it is next to sacredness. So keep washing your hands. But we've created this fear among surfaces and environments. And if you look at the media and you watch all these people in white suits hosing down streets with disinfectants, people wiping things off, those have been totally needless. They do not protect us against this virus. Oh boy. As we get further into this battle, we've got to know the facts about what does protect us. So when you're in a crowd with people and you're sharing their air, that's a problem. But if you're getting a package delivered to your door or you're somehow coming to a doorknob, that's not the way you're getting this. And the CDC has appropriately updated the scientific information to reflect that. So this is the, I forget his title, but he works for the CDC. This is the research epidemiologist for the CDC that everyone looks to. Okay. He's the guy that was on many of our videos. He's, you know, he's been on, I think he was on Joe Rogan's show, like, at the very beginning of all this. Oh, yeah. So this is, like, the top guy everyone would listen to. But I'm looking at this with a skeptic eye, thinking those words are going to come back to haunt him. Oh, really? It just feels that way. Like, it does, it when, you tell, when you tell me that masks don't make a difference, suddenly we're wearing masks, when, you know... When you see China spraying the streets and fogging the streets, you're telling me like all their research where they've dealt with these kind of viruses and these epidemics, you know, for the last 20 years at least, that they have it wrong? I'm just like, eh, I don't know if I totally believe that. It feels more like a, a way to make people feel safer. Yeah. You know, like I, I could certainly see if he said something like, listen, you don't need to be hosing down the asphalt on a highway. Like, yeah. you're not getting it from the bottom of your shoes or something. But to act like you don't have to worry about any surfaces. And he didn't, he didn't go as far to say, don't worry about surfaces on a subway or something. He was specifically talking about groceries and packages coming to your house. But I don't understand this. Like, I understand if you sneeze openly like you like to do and cough openly like you like to do. Well, I don't want to get it on me and then touch a surface that you touch. But we now see that that's the best route. Oh. So you should cough into No, I, your... I, I, I sneeze into the air and then it falls on the surfaces where it dies. Well, we've seen videos where we know that's not true. <laughs> but it just makes me wonder, like, what good is washing our hands if getting it from surfaces is not likely? Well, that, is, shouldn't yes. you just be like handshakes and hugs? We shouldn't do that anymore because what's the difference? Yeah, I, I completely agree. Are we getting Where it by else? walking around in the air and it's hitting my hands, <laughs> right? And then it gets on me. Exactly. Like, if it just somebody seems like, where's coughs the line? into their hand and then they grab the subway bar, and then you grab the subway bar, and you touch your face, it seems like that is the exact same as you shaking someone's hand and then touching your face. Yeah. So like you said, if they said once it touches a surface, it's no longer infectious, and therefore washing your hands also doesn't do anything, it would make more sense to me. Like, okay, it can't live on surfaces or our hands. we've seen studies in a lab 
where they're not saying that. I know. You're telling me that on a cardboard package it lasts 24 hours and on steel it lasts 48 hours, 72 hours, whatever the number was, in a lab, but in the real world, let's just it say- It dies in seconds. Yeah, let's just say it's half that. Then what in the world is going on? I just, yeah. <laughs> it infuriates me because I feel like I trust this guy and I respect him because other peers respect him, but I just feel like what he's saying feels so far off. And what the CD say, CDC has been saying feels so far off. So earlier in that clip, you guys can find it online, I'm sure. He was quizzed about it at the beginning, like, whoa, isn't it weird that the CDC would come out and say this? And he said, no. And he said kind of what I said yesterday. He was like, I applaud them for not caring about the way that they look and instead just reporting the facts as they discover them. And if you look back at what I've been saying for the last two months, I have said we shouldn't be so focused on surfaces. All we should be wor worried about is masks and washing hands. But I just don't understand the washing hands because that seems to be a contact surface type of transmission. Yeah, I agree. And then, yeah, and then I don't, he didn't just mention doorknobs, right? There was another clip, if it wasn't just him, where the guy was like, you don't need to be worried about doorknobs. Just wash your hands. And I'm like, but you wash your hands after touching the doorknob. Like, that's what the point of washing your hand is. Like you said, people aren't sneezing and then you're like running around swatting the air, getting your hands yeah. dirty with sneeze. So it just, it doesn't make well, any it's sense. It's the same reason that like so many uh, operatories and medical facilities have the kick to turn on the water. <laughs> You know, because you still don't want to wash your hands and then have to touch anything. You kick to, I mean, it's, conven it's wildly convenient, too. I almost want one of those in my house. If you could just kick the bottom and yeah. like, shut, like, anything would turn on. But I don't know. I feel like this is going to be a bad idea. And down the road, we're going to see a reversal on that. Speaking of reversals, though, or listening to the CDC, maybe, these next clips, have you heard anything about what is going on uh, with, with New York City or New York State in terms of the people dying in the nursing homes? No. Uh, Cuomo is kind of under fire because they're saying that over 5,000 people have died because there was a system in place, a policy in place, that said basically, if you have COVID in a nursing home, you should be able to go back to your nursing home, or we should not remove people. Oh, I have heard about this. And yes. so this came to light today, and so we have uh, a couple videos on this. Tragedy at New York's nursing homes. Critics are demanding accountability, and they say so far, Governor Cuomo's response is coming up short. CBS 2's Tony Aiello has this. This March 25th directive is cited by many for contributing to the more than 5,000 COVID-19 deaths at New York nursing homes. We saw that the ramifications could be potentially dangerous. At Gerwin Health and Comac, CEO Stuart Almer was an early and vocal critic of the March order from the state health department, mandating nursing homes to take recovering COVID-19 patients while prohibiting the homes from requiring the patients test negative. The goal was to relieve hospitals as the pandemic wave began to build. As soon as we saw the mandate, Certainly, we were very concerned, as are all family members, um, you know, with the concern that they might expose their loved ones to COVID-19. Petition and email campaigns warned introducing COVID patients to nursing homes put vulnerable residents at risk. Governor Cuomo rescinded the order on May 10th and this week blamed the original policy on the Trump administration. Why did the state uh, do that with COVID patients in nursing homes? It's because the state followed President Trump's CDC guidance. So they should ask President Trump. An answer that did not impress Queens Democratic Assemblyman Ron Kim. You can't go on national TV one day and say the buck stops with me, blame me, and the next day things don't go well. Uh, blame everyone else. New York has 40% more nursing home residents than Florida, but 700% more nursing home COVID deaths. Is the New York mandate to blame? You can't draw a straight line to that and that spreading, uh, you know, positive cases. Uh, but intuitively, that is what may have occurred. Gerwin created a separate COVID unit. The disease still claimed 40 residents. They now celebrate every COVID-19 recovery and look forward to working with the state to craft policies that protect residents in the event of a second wave.
in Comac, Long Island. Tony Aiello, CBS 2 News. I think my grandmother said that the guy who's got it uh, in her nursing homes in his 90s, and she, she was like, he's got a mild case. He's going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's in the hospital, but she's acting like he'll be back soon. So, so I have a couple more videos on this. I'm trying to remember. I think this one's just from another news case, but basically the, uh, the governor of Florida has been scrutinized because apparently there's some controversy on how the numbers have been reported or maybe suppressed in Florida. Maybe that ties in well here. But this next article is just kind of comparing, again, New York to Florida. And you were saying your grand, your whole family's in Florida. Your grandmother's in a nursing home in Florida. They yeah. just had their first case. Yep. So maybe it's just a, a, an element of delayed response. Maybe we're going to see what happened in New York happen in Florida, but Florida's a few months behind. I hope not, but um, this next couple clips kind of plays on this story as well. Let me get to these super chats real quick. Uh, Greg says, the amount of mis misinformation and confusion by the experts regarding avoidance is so confusing for everyone. There has been distinct lack of precise knowledge and advice that is just scaring people. I agree. And it's also, it's not just scaring people. Maybe it scared people before. I mean, we had you wiping down every box coming into the house and stuff and burning uh, food in the oven, you know, from fast food restaurants before consuming I just don't, it. I don't think those things are bad. Those aren't going to hurt anybody. Sure. Not but, wearing masks. If that's now the thing we should be doing, when they said we shouldn't be wearing masks, maybe the CDC is to blame for a large percentage of the cases if they were giving out wrong information. But, I, like you said, I don't think any of this stuff is harmful. If you're, if you're extra cautious... It might be foolish, but it's not harmful. But the harm can now come in on the back end where people are like, I don't trust anything they said because every week they're changing their tune and they're telling us the opposite of what they told us the week before. And that's when the people that already are a little skeptical of the government and scientists no. and stuff are just going to be like, screw this. I'm going they've back out. They, they've shot at wolf too many times. Exactly. Uh, Professor Moneybags says he's not saying the virus doesn't live on surfaces. He's saying that if you touch the surface and then wash your hands, it mitigates the contact. The important thing is hand washing. I understand that, but that's definitely not what he said. He, he was like, when you see footage of people in white coats spraying down buses doing and nothing. stuff, that is not helpful. We just need to be washing hands. So that doesn't make sense. Well, how do you wash a hand, your hands when you're in the subway of New York City? Right. It's not like there's sinks there. Right. So either doing the UVC lighting method that we just showed a couple nights ago and disinfecting the whole subway every couple hours or every couple, anytime you can, either that's helpful or it's not. And it seems that the narrative now is saying that won't do anything. Well, I have to imagine that New York City probably disinfects their subway every night, regardless of the coronavirus. Yeah, but every night's not enough. We, they need to be doing, they need to have, I mean, when you go to grocery stores and stuff, they're wiping down everything. Everything, every But person. my point is, is that they're doing it for a reason, even without COVID-19. So to say that it's pointless now, it, it was just weird the way that that guy acted like it was completely worthless. I think there was a couple other super chats we missed. Um, Nerd45 says Dr. Michael Osterholm is with the University of M, not CDC. Is it Michigan? I'm not sure. Minnesota, maybe? I thought he was advising the CDC. I mean, he definitely is associated with that university. He definitely acted like the thing that he said previous to my clip, he acted like he was not affiliated with them, but I certainly Maybe don't I misread something. I mean, there's a very good chance I misread something, but I thought once I saw him at that university and also speaking on behalf of the CDC, but. Are you ready for this next clip? Let's do it. The missing Ling. She just wanted to say, A. Hey, thanks for the super chat. Uh, this one? Yeah. 
I think the reason that they got it so wrong is because, yet again, you have so many people in the media who are driven by partisanship rather than common sense and sort of having an open mind about things. I mean, it, it's not complicated, the difference between the way Ron DeSantis handled the situation and Andrew Cuomo uh, handled the situation. In New York, uh, Governor Cuomo prohibited uh, nursing homes from, uh, from saying no, turning away patients who were infected with, with the virus from coming into the nursing homes. Well, a, any common sense uh, analysis would have told you that's a very, very bad idea uh, when you're talking about a virus that targets elderly people. And it was, it was a host of, of, of uh, decisions like that, just simple common sense decisions that Ron DeSantis made in Florida that, that uh, Andrew Cuomo in New York did not make, uh, largely, I would argue, uh, driven by a political bias. And of course, the media, because they're so infected by the political bias, completely ran off and, and, and they're still heaping hosannas on Governor Cuomo today. What do you say? They're keeping what? Heaping hosannas? Is that like a religious term? Let's, let's listen to that again. Political bias completely ran off, and, and, and they're still heaping hosannas on Governor Cuomo today. Never heard of we that in my life. We need an explanation of that phrase. <laughs> Might um, as well just go into the next, the next clip, because I think it, it still has to do with this whole okay. debate. Yeah, but you know what? The, the, Florida has 1.2 million more senior citizens than New York. New York has double, more than double, the fatalities from nursing home, including residents and staff, than Florida. Florida has 2,100. New York has 5,500. You, know you know what he did? You know what Ron DeSantis did? He studied what happened in 1918, in 1957, 1968, yep. and he said they didn't do national shutdowns. We're going to be smart. We're going to do targeted risk mitigation, like social distancing masks. And also he said, do, take, he said shut down the nursing homes. Don't allow COVID-19 back in. He right. saw what happened in South Korea and Italy, and he saw that 80 percent, you know, massive amounts of the fatalities were elderly. And that's true now. CDC is saying 80 percent of U.S. fatalities are from nursing homes. He also zoomed in lots of PPE. Did she just say 80 percent of even U.S.? Elderly and nursing homes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that true? I think it's true with the elderly, but most are all most elderly aren't in nursing homes. So is that's, two numbers? I, I, that's what I remember hearing a long time ago in Europe. It was like over 80% of the deaths were from nursing homes. Well, we know that was true apparently in Sweden. They said Sweden's deaths were so high because it got to the nursing homes early. Yeah. And it was people in nursing homes that died. Yeah. Um, that's the end of that clip. Yeah. So, you know, I think I find it hard to believe that these ridiculous governors are reading and studying the 1819 <laughs> pandemic well, and all the other <laughs> pandemics and looking at Asia and being like, you know what, we need to shut down the nursing homes. I think they are getting guidance from somewhere, but it brings back the idea of, does Cuomo have like an excuse to say like, this is the policy that we implemented? And this was set by, he said, Trump's CDC. What does that even mean? Like, are people now saying that these back and forth we're going with the CDC that we just talked about is caused by by the president making them say these things? Like, can we trust the CDC or not? Is all it seems like we should be saying. And if you take the CDC's guidance three months ago and you say, we're going to allow people to go back into nursing homes and you don't change it until May 10th, 12 days ago, that seems like that's, that's on you if that's your policy. But then I also say how much policy is being determined by the governors? Are, is there any responsibility for the owners of these retirement homes, nursing homes, to say, like, you know what? We, this is the policy we are going to set. Yeah, but it sounded like in New York it became illegal not to accept infected COVID patients. So then it does in, go up. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty wild. Uh, Professor Longmoney says it's Uncle Penny Bags. But so I think Uncle Penny Bags, I actually saw this today. I read that phrase today, of all things. Oh, really? I think that's the name of the Monopoly guy, isn't it? Oh, I have no idea. I didn't know he had, <laughs> I mean, I assumed he had a name, but I think Uncle Penny Bags, and maybe I saw it written as two words, Uncle Penny Bags. But he says, uh, but here's 10 bucks because Lee always pronounces my last name 
correctly, Roberson. Okay. Uh, okay, I thought he was going to say that I pronounce it incorrectly, but I apparently pronounce it I correctly. bet a lot of people put a T in there. Robertson? Yeah. And you say Roberson? Roberson. I don't know. I don't know what I say, but uh, being that my first name is Robert, I should be able to get that correct. I think the number one story um, that I wanted to lead this off with is actually in the description of the video today, but I couldn't find any video articles about it. And the number one story is this Lancet study that says hydrochloroquine is actually more dangerous by, take, by, by you know, administering it to COVID patients. And if you guys click on the link in the description, you can bring up this study. And what's interesting about this study is they do four different tests. One test is with hydrochloroquine. Another one is with chloroquine. The third one is hydrochloroquine with, uh, what, what is the, the other drug here? Zinc. No, they don't do it with zinc, but they do it with macrolide, which is the, uh, I'm drawing a blank with the- Come on, Patrick. It's the antibiotic. Sure. Uh, acetomyrosin. Probably but Yeah, that. that's totally what it but is. But what it's basically saying is, if you scroll down a little bit, there's almost 100,000 patients, and they divide these up into, you know, a, 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 they, they divide this up so that all four of those different studies can be administered to the patients. But then they also have a control group. So you divide it in half, control group, and then the remaining people, you divide those into four and administer everything. And what it seems that this is saying, and I'm having a hard time completely understanding it. I'm seeing this in some of the videos, but it sounds like this is administered 48 hours from being diagnosed with COVID. So it's not a preventative thing like Trump is doing, apparently, but it's also not being treated with zinc and hydrochloroquine early on. I don't know what early on means. Do you remember the studies that were going on in New York? That well, guy was being... just saying at the first signs of symptoms, he wanted to get people to take this with the zinc, and he said the zinc was actually the magic that was keeping the virus. Well, this study, I, this okay. study does not talk about zinc at all, but okay. it also says if you were diagnosed later than 48 hours, you were excluded from the test, which is good, because we all believe that taking hydrochloroquine late may not do anything. But if you scroll down, there's just some interesting things. Like, let me see if I can find everything. There's, there's some graphs here. Um, and maybe people out there can try to read this and understand it a little bit better than I did. Um, so right up here, this talks about how they divided the people um, up into different categories. But then scroll down, there's just more uh, right here. So go up just a touch. So one column is the survivors, the people that lived. And then the other column is the people that died. And then they show you everything. So the age, the average age of uh, people who died is 60, and the ones that survived is 53. I don't know if that's enough of a deviation. Um, I thought someone said the other day, and somebody please fact check me on this, but they said something like the average age of the people who have died in Europe from COVID-19 is older than the average mortality rate. So it was like, you're already living past what the average person lives past. Okay. And then it's killing you. Well, there were some things here. So the average age of people that did not survive is I mean, 60. Yeah. And then those that survived is 53. That doesn't yep. seem like that big of a difference. No, it doesn't. But look at some of these other things. Look at the obesity. Two down. Yeah. The survivors were... 26% of them were obese versus 60% that died were obese. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then scroll down. One other thing that's kind of interesting here is it shows you the female and males. Like you can see many more uh, males are dying in mm -hmm. the death category. So that's separating out. Um, we also talked about race a little bit. It's interesting to look at race here. You know, 62% of whites are dying versus 17% of blacks. So definitely, I mean, there's more whites as now, well, but... Well, okay, so this isn't that 62% of white people who get it are dying. This is out of the entire sample size, 62% yep. of the dead are white. Yeah. All right, that's not that helpful. Scroll down. Um, this, I thought this was interesting here. Go up just enough so they can read it, if they can read it. You guys, click on the link, but comorbidities 
at baseline. So this is what they're judging the people coming in before anything happens to them, right? If you look at this, 11% of the people that live already had coronary artery disease. 22% of the people that died had this. So that's twice as many people died that already had that disease. If you just start comparing some of these numbers, like congestive heart failure, failure that almost looks the same. 2 to 5%, I mean, maybe that's enough to be significant. Um, diabetes, the people that died twice, two, like double the amount that died had diabetes coming in versus those that survived. Now, remind me of what this study is. Is this the hydroxychloroquine study? This is all four different studies. But they're okay. te taking all four of the people that took the drug. They're, they're, this, this test right here is just comparing those that survived versus those that died. Uh, what's the sample size? Uh, 90,000 people. Oh, so it's big. Pretty big. Okay. All I'm trying to say with this is go through some of this and just look at some of these numbers because um, some of them, like former smokers, they're identical. So it doesn't seem like that is that big of a difference. Hmm. Immunocompromised, look at that one. Well, it's twice the percentage. Maybe that's the way you look at this. Two versus four is twice. So maybe that's a big indicator there. But I'm just looking at diabetes. I'm like, man, most of the people that survived there's such a lower chance of having diabetes than those that died. I mean, that's a lot of the people that died, 21% of them had diabetes coming into this. Hmm. You can continue. And what is this one? Hyper, I'm not even going to try to read this. Hyperlipidemia? What is that? Because that is 34% of the people had that who died. But 31% that lived had that also. So maybe that's like a very common thing within our society. I don't know what that is. Hypers means over, and then uh, lipids of fat, and then edemia is like low. You're super fat. Um, does that have to do with your cholesterol levels, maybe? I don't, I don't know. We'd have to look that up. But you can continue to scroll down. So this is just for the people coming in. Keep going down. There's more tables. Here's, let me scroll up just a little bit. Here's the table that shows the different treatments. So you have your control group, which you have, I mean, that says 81,000 people are in the control group that were okay. given nothing. And then the chloroquine, I don't even know, I thought we were just talking about hydrochloroquine, but I don't know enough about those drugs to say one way or another, but there's 1,800, there's 3,000 with hydrochloroquine, there's 3,000 with chloroquine with the... Uh, Patrick, it's hydroxychloroquine, actually. Well, it's chloroquine, the second oh. column. Oh, you said hydrochloroquine. Well, the one on the right's hydrochloroquine. Hydroxy. Hydroxychloroquine, and then chloroquine... I don't know. This stuff, you can go through here and you can see what percentage of people survived. It definitely feels like when you add the antibiotic to it, more people, I believe, died of that. I need an expert who's not Patrick to explain this to me. I think some of the detail, the devil's in the details here. There's no doubt that hydroxychloroquine is not being that effective in this case, but can you say for certain it's the drug and not some of the other underlying conditions. That's yeah. all I'm trying to say. Yeah. It's, and could it be way more effective, like the other doctor said, when you paired up with zinc, which none of these studies did, none of these patients got the zinc as well, and you treat them early. These people are treated fairly early, but what does that mean? From when they were diagnosed, these are also hospitalization. So if you went to the hospital, you're already now not in the, uh, the mild cases. You remember we talked about that? A mild case of this means you might be on your deathbed at home, but you did not have to go to okay. the hospital. These were all people that were hospitalized. At least that's the way this seems to be written. Now, granted, that's a huge article. I only skimmed it for an hour or so. So there's a lot to take out of it, but um, I feel like this is the biggest story of the day for sure. And people on one side might be saying, like, this is proof that this drug does nothing, but... Do we still know for certain? There's doctors out there that believe it's doing something early on paired with other drugs. Trump certainly knows. We've got a few super chats here. Uh, Professor Long Money says, yes, rich Uncle Pennybags is the Monopoly mascot. Most people incorrect, incorrect, incorrectly say Roberson. Oh, <laughs> I've never heard anyone say Roberson. Call me Robert. Uh, Bruce 
says Team Patrick, five points. Team Lee, four points. It's a very low, small sample size. It is a very small sample size. It can't be trusted. Greg says, one thing that hasn't been discussed is China's bullying tactics, tactics towards smaller nations that have demanded an investigation into the source. They are now using import bans to punish. I haven't heard anything like that. I haven't that. heard anything about this either. I mean, what are, what are smaller nations... Smaller nations that have demanded an investigation into the source. I assume these are a lot of uh, Asian countries that probably depend on China and their supply chains. Hmm. But I don't. I haven't heard anything about it. I would have assumed that you know there'd be a NATO or something, and they would just say we're going to go in and we're going to look into it. Because isn't the United States looking into it? I mean, Trump is always like, we we have people that are looking into it. I can't talk about it right now, but we know what really happened. Uh, I just read high cholesterol. I think that's what the hyper lipid edemia, okay. whatever that word was, um, HDL, and you ever get those studies done? Yeah, I'm always good. Yeah, you're always good. I mean, good. have you seen that? Oh, you can tell just, yeah, I see it now. Yeah, yeah so you're, I'm you're, good. You're low on that. I, I keep thinking, I keep thinking like, man, I need to lose some weight. Even though it's weird, I'm I'm lighter now yeah. than I think I was two months ago. Yeah. But I still feel like the chub is here. I think some of that's just us getting older. Like, maybe that will never leave. Oh, it'll... I mean, I see 50-year-old guys that are ripped up. I'm like, you know, maybe I got to get a little TRT or something. I, but. I always look at them, and maybe I'm very wrong here, but I always think they were always ripped. They were just one of the genetically good guys, you know? I've never been fat, but like as I get older, or maybe since I'm on this drug, I feel like I'm just a little more bloated and pudgier than ever. But I mean, there's a year or two I was ago, I was pretty fit. I just feel like our meta once your metabolism slows down, it's like you I may don't know. never. I've seen lots of studies that say like the most your metabolism can really slow down is like four to five hundred calories a day. That's all that it's slowing down. Everything else has to do with lifestyle. Yeah, and what, how active you are, and what you're putting in your mouth is really all. Really, all that matters is just what you're putting in your mouth. Well, we won't and go I'm down. I'm eating some nutter butters. I'm not going to go down that road. Uh, Fan May Who, who likes to give me a lot of crap, is saying, Patrick, do you own stock for the hydroxy? I don't even know what that is, but I assume he means the hydroxychloroquine that I can't pronounce correctly. I don't think you can buy. Stock I think this that. is a generic now. So yeah. people that are saying that, oh, it's Trump or people are investing. Just to make money, like, it's like saying, are you going to invest in aspirin? I don't know that th <laughs> the money's not in that drug. The money's in these other drugs that are probably not even created yet. Yeah. Or that have patents behind them that are not able to have generics yet. So I don't know that this idea that, oh, you're just heavily invested is the reason that these are being pushed. I've got a, another clip here about the vaccine test subjects. Graduate student Dan McAteer is one of more than a thousand volunteers who signed up to be subjects in the first round of human trials. All participants had to be between 18 and 55 and in excellent health. Half were given the experimental COVID-19 vaccine and half were given a control vaccine. I, like all of us, felt very much uh, impotent and powerless in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, so I thought, right, this sounds like maybe I can contribute in some way. Mother of two, Lydia Guthrie, had her inoculation three weeks ago. I did have a few moments beforehand of thinking, whoa, you know, I might be injected with this experimental vaccine. That sounds like something out of a science fiction film. Um, but we're all having to make decisions about risk. Guthrie says she experienced some side effects similar to a mild flu. Next week, she will go back for her first blood test. We have an e-diary system, so every day I get an email as a prompt to log in and complete a short questionnaire about my health and well-being. Um, I also complete a questionnaire about my daily activities. The so this is one of your videos, right? Yeah. I started this video and I was like, I don't trust CNN. So I did the other video. Oh, but, you have another one that's similar? Um, well, number eight is the exact same one, but I don't, 
I don't know, what did we even learn from that video? It just seems so lifestyle, and let's talk to the people, and like... I don't know, I just, I find it very interesting. There are people potentially risking their lives for you, and just like, you know, a soldier going off to war or something, I feel like we should at least show them appreciation for the risk they're taking for the greater I good. I agree with that. If you play, my clip does not have the better audio, I admit, but they maybe talk a little bit more about what's actually happening. Is it going to show the exact same thing we just watched? No, oh, I okay. mean, it's about the same thing. This and uh, TRT World's health correspondent, Nicola Hill, is in London with more. Um, Nicola, help us understand. So if the vaccine um, didn't stop monkeys from getting infected, um, why are they continuing the trial? Well, it certainly showed that there was still the virus in the nasal passageways of the monkeys. But this study showed that there was less virus in the lungs and in the airways. And those monkeys that had been given the vaccine didn't then get the pneumonia, which is something that causes the severe COVID-19 and even death. So because of that, the Oxford group want to, want to expand their human trials that they're doing at the moment. So far, they've um, vaccinated about 800 people. And Professor Pollard, Professor Andrew Pollard, who's leading the group, said today that he has got data on these phase one human trials, which was looking at safety and an immune response. But he's not publishing that at the moment because it would affect the integrity of the trial as people don't know whether they have the real vaccine or whether they had a placebo. But he must be confident enough to extend it. And he's now wanting more than 10,000 extra people. First of all, he wants three different groups. He wants five to 12 year olds, 56 to 69 year olds and over 70s. And this is when he wants to look at the safety and the immune response, similar to the phase one trials he's done already. And then he wants a further 10,000 people from 18 sites across the whole of the UK to see whether the vaccine is effective. So this is the phase two trial. This is the second step. And that's what he's um, recruiting those people now. So I, I had heard one person who was skeptical over the success of these vaccine studies because, like she said, she touched on it, that um, they, they weren't, the monkeys were not immune to the virus, yeah. but they, they weren't hit as hard yeah. from the virus. And so in one of the clips, I think I decided not to put it in here, somebody asks a doctor, are we trying to create something that makes you immune or would something be fine that just makes people a little immune, I don't know what the word would be. And he was like, I don't think it's that simple. I think it's all or nothing. Either it works or it doesn't. Well, that's what I've started to think about today and watching some of that clip and then some of the other stuff with Moderna. I don't know if you saw that controversy about like the, the, the top guys sold all their stock at the highest point on Monday. Okay. I sold it 20% up, but it was 30% up at opening hours okay. and they sold. Now, they may have sold because they had a market order and there was an execution and it just happened to sell because it hit some number that they were wanting to sell anyway. So I don't know if it was totally malicious, but the point I wanna make is that we are seeing here that this, this study isn't showing antibodies being produced, right? So the Moderna one seems to be way better in the sense that 100 people had the naturalizing or neutralizing antibodies created. And then this is just saying like, some monkeys still had the virus, but it wasn't doing, you know, the pneumonia, which we're now saying is like, maybe the majority of people are dying of this, yeah. but there's other complications as well. I think that's the long-term news is that this thing is attacking way more organs than what we originally thought. And so it, it's exactly what you're saying. Which one is more important? You know, should we be going for the, all, the antibodies that are going to allow you to be okay? Are we going for like, hey, let's continue this research because the virus was only in the nasal cavity and not in the lungs. And then it starts making me think like, well, how much government funding and private funding are these companies going to get when they have results that may not be that great of news, but they're at least something. It makes me think a lot of these pharmaceutical companies are going to make a lot of money going through some of these trials that it may be just like we threw some stuff at the wall and it was close enough to the bullseye that we're going to keep going. But like, maybe it's not good enough, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, hopefully we live in a current climate where you might create some drug that's 98% there, but that's not good enough because this other company got to 100% first 
I mean, that'd be the best that case scenario. That would be the best scenario, but I'm just wondering, there's a lot of skeptic skepticism behind Moderna, and it's, they're saying, like, they've never produced anything like this, and what they're trying to produce has never been done in mankind, you know? Like, it's just a huge, it's a very small target that we're trying to hit with a lot of darts, and you start saying, like, are there going to be huge scams, and are there going to be huge run-ups on these stocks? Are there going to be these pump-and-dump things? Like, is other stuff behind the scenes going on with these pharmaceutical companies, especially the ones that are public, that people like me are able to buy? Luckily, I fell on the right side of that coin. Have you bought back in? I did buy back in. And it's up like, I have to check. I think it was up like 5% today or something. But Not bad. Um, did you buy them for more? Or the same amount? No, no. I, I, I put like 20% in okay. from where I was. The other thing that's interesting with this that goes back to the Moderna argument is the head guy on this study said in this news article that he didn't want to release some of the findings and the side effects publicly because he didn't want that to affect the control groups and the people getting the placebos. And I'm thinking, maybe that's totally a normal thing. Yeah, it just But it also bad. feels like Moderna did this as well. They withheld some of the information and didn't make it public, but only shared some of the most positive stuff that they found. So it just kind of feels like if we're trying to be the most transparent, maybe this can be as simple as saying we don't want to release too much information on this case because we need a jury pool of people who have not been influenced. But it just feels like, I mean, are, are the side effects so bad that if you get the placebo, you know that you got the placebo because you didn't get these crazy <laughs> side effects? And then it just, it just makes me think too, like how many people throughout the world are going to be signing up for all these studies? Because this is just one study. Probably there's definitely dozens of forerunners, but there might be hundreds of different studies. And if tens of thousands of people are taking all these experimental drugs, and we find out that there was really bad stuff that's going on, you know, what's the difference between doing horrible tests on humans like we did in the last hundred years versus what we're doing now? The only difference seems to be there's a fear of something that's going on at this very moment. And we're not doing it against people's will. They know the risks involved. I know, but what if this is all not as scary as we believe? Or what if they sell you by making you feel like there's no side effects, but there's side effects, but we can't publish? I don't know. It just it feels like an ethical gray area. Maybe that's the whole world of experimental drugs, and this is where this thing lives all the time, and we're just now becoming aware of it. But... I don't know. I just think in the future, you and I are probably going to be talking all about a lot more about studies that have gone wrong and about companies that have gotten massive amounts. You know, I hope there's not much of a future of this show. I hope. I hope so, too. I but I never I... thought we'd be like on episode 60 or whatever it is that we're on. We're beyond that. We've got to be close. We're probably over 70 episodes now. I think we're on quarantine day 68. And I think we started the show a few days after quarantine started. Okay. So I think we're on like 65. Okay. We got a super chat here from Greg. He says, on a po positive note, we have been watching F-Stoppers live since the inception. That's, that's nice, but we haven't been doing live shows for that long, Greg, but thank you. Great work, guys. We appreciate the banter over coffee and Vegemite toast. Oh, you shouldn't do that. Get some... Uh, Just like cream cheese and toast would be better avocado. than that. Avocado. That's, that's what the toast, kids are doing now. Egg, butter, jelly, not the Vegemite. FanMe is saying, no, they disclose all of the possible side effects. I've done studies. Well, why did they just report that he didn't want to give all of well, the information? I'm sure they, they disclose the potential side effects, but now, if they've already injected people weeks ago, they're seeing the real side effects, and that's what he I thought this study was saying we are going from phase one to phase two, and we now need 10,000 people to do a study on. And that's where your oh, video, okay. they're all just coming forward. There was, I believe, 1,000 people maybe to get it into phase one or phase two, but the majority of phase one was the animals with the monkeys. So I don't think there's been that many people besides 1,000 people that have been injected with this. But I see. Okay, yeah. So you w if you knew what happened with the first 1,000, you would need to be honest with the next 10,000. So that is strange. All right, next up here... Well, this is the study that I w we just talked about, so I don't know if you want to read that one. It, somehow you moved it all the way to the bottom. Do I need to read it? What is this? This was the, the study that I said. I that understand. I, is this a video? This is a video. Okay. I guess I did find a video. 
I just didn't see it up at the top. A large new study links hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine to a higher risk of death in coronavirus patients. Researchers looked at seriously ill infected patients in more than 600 hospitals worldwide, and those treated with either medication were more likely to die or develop a heart condition. Now keep in mind, this is the drug that the president has called a game changer. If things don't go as uh, planned, it's not going to kill anybody. It will this be wonderful. Will yeah, be so I don't I don't know if people at home can see this. Well, it looks so different on this And camera, maybe though. it's this this TV that we've got here, but I mean, it appeared that CNN raised the satura saturation in the orange you channel. You think they're doing that? You remember the uh, you remember the whole O.J. Simpson thing where like Newsweek and Time ran the exact same mugshot, yeah, and one of them made him look black, and then the other one just looked like a normal picture. Yeah, you know, like I, I don't want to get you know clutch my pearls on either side of the coin. You know, Biden make made this statement today about like you ain't black. Yeah, and even that, I'm not like oh my god, I can't believe. Like I understand what he was trying to say. And with that O.J. Simpson picture, I'm like, are they trying to make him look more black or are they putting an effect on an image as like a design choice? Very similar to what they did to Trump's face with our buddy Noam's picture. You know, they put some crazy effect on his face yeah. to make it look like it was edited. I mean, maybe this camera angle that we haven't paused on, maybe they've desaturated. Yeah, or, I mean, like, or this camera is set to a wrong white balance. From something. this clip, yeah, he looks... A little more human, but back here. Well, these, I mean, are, these, that, are, different, these are different days, too. I know. It's, it's not so just a different camera. Crazy, though. man. It's, it's totally neon orange with white I mean, around his eyes. He looks like a villain. It's like <laughs> if you were to, if like Conan O'Brien was to have like an arch nemesis, he would make him <laughs> look like this. It'd be like Raccoon Man or something. Can I say that? Is that? Kill anybody. Raccoon Man. It would be wonderful. It'll be so beautiful. It'll be a gift from heaven if it works. If some other person put it forward, they'd say, oh, let's go with it. You know, what do you have to lose? Try it, if you'd like. I've seen things that I sort of like, so what do I know? I'm not a doctor. I'm not a doctor, but I have common sense. I think it gives you an additional level of safety, but you can ask many doctors are in favor of it. It's had a great reputation, and if it was somebody else other than me, people would say, gee, isn't that smart? A lot of people swear by it. It's gotten a, a bad reputation only because I'm promoting it, so I'm obviously a very bad promoter. I've taken it, I think, just about two weeks. I think it's another day, so, and I'm still here. What do you have to lose, he asked. Well, potentially your life. Elizabeth Cohen is CNN senior medical correspondent. Dr. Jorge Rodriguez is an internal uh, medicine and viral specialist. Elizabeth, let's dive into the specifics about what this large study found. Tell me about these increases in risk for both death and heart problems. All right, Brianna, let's just jump into these numbers. This is a study that was led by folks at Harvard and was published in The Lancet just today. They looked at six patients in 671 hospitals. So these were hospitalized, excuse me, coronavirus patients on six continents. So what about... With that study, you were saying like 90,000 people. Well, this was one thing that was confusing as I was reading it. 90,000 people are in this study, but 80,000 are the control group, and 15,000 are in the four categories that they've now divided up. Because if you looked at the number in those categories, it was like 3,000, 3,000, 3,000, 3,000, like, you know, it wasn't... Okay. The, but, the, but it's not 671 in anything. 671 is the number of hospitals. Oh. So 15,000 people oh, were yes. hospitalized okay. patients. Again, and I think they opened this clip up saying uh, very critical patients. Yeah. Which I think we've been arguing this whole time. I mean, we don't know. We're not doctors. I have no dog in the race, dog That's in the true. hunt, horse in the race. I don't care one way or another, you know. But I'm just trying to find the truth. And a lot of these other doctors have said, we've taken this drug with zinc and early on have seen incredible results. But there's this weird political narrative, and I'm so curious to know what is going on in other people out there, your countries. Yeah. Are you guys having this ridiculous debate the way that we are in America? Because this feels totally political. Yeah. 
they're, they're even not totally being honest here. They're, not say, they're saying this will kill you, but it's critical patients. Who are on the verge of death anyway. Right. And many people all over the world have been taking this drug preventatively for years. For other things. For other things. So, so 15,000 people received different, four different drugs, different combinations. And then, so you have to divide the 15,000 up. But the study is like 90,000, but most of those people are in the control group. Should I finish the 30 seconds? Uh, sure, because they have some doctors talk that are a little more knowledgeable. Nearly 15,000 of these patients receiving hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine, often in combination with other drugs. What they found is that those who were taking hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine were 33 to 45 percent more likely to die, even after they adjusted, because there were some differences between patients who weren't taking the drug, who were taking the drugs, and a control group who was not. Also, the patients taking the drugs were between 2.4 and five times more likely to develop heart arrhythmias. Hmm. Somebody's even saying they were like this, we should look this up. Uh, they're saying Fauci was talking about hydroxychloroquine in 2005 with SARS-1. Like maybe this was something proposed as a drug okay. back with SARS-1. SARS-1's related to some degree to this. I mean, they're very similar families of drugs. And then other people in here are saying this isn't happening at all in other countries. Like, this is only well, po politicized here in the United States. They're saying that pe people are being given hydroxychloroquine. I don't know. I mean, I have to read Yeah, you comments. guys got to be more clear As about that. As they're coming in, but they're just saying... Um, they're just saying it's not this political argument. It almost seems like if I say here, where, where's our boy Fan May Hugh, who loves to hate on me, if I say maybe hydroxychloroquine is successful if you gave it to people before they were in critical situations, I'm like suddenly now like a Trump supporter or I'm drinking the Trump Kool-Aid. Right. And I'm like, no, I'm just trying to make sense of these other doctors that right. have this science too. Yeah. But when these studies come out, and maybe we're going to see more studies like this, and we're going to be like, yeah, hydroxychloroquine was the worst thing you could have taken. But when you see these studies come out and these news organizations spin it like the gotcha moment, when there's a lot of devils in the details that even I'm not qualified to read, but I'm just saying you should try to read this stuff and make sense of it before you jump to some conclusion. As Eddie Bravo would say, you got to look into it, man. You got to look into you it. You got to look into it. The truth is out there. I'm not saying, and it's but only on YouTube. You got to look into it. All right, we got a few super chats here. The Charlie Pappas just donated 20 bucks and had nothing to say. Thank you very much. We appreciate you. Jeffrey says, you should consider keeping a live show or podcast at least weekly after the lockdown. Uh, by the way, next drink's on me. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, I guess we could do that. Once the lockdown lets up, maybe we could do a weekly coronavirus video. But we definitely are keeping the live shows. We're just going to move back into, like, photography, video, tech, stuff that is more F-stoppers related. Uh, Kev Klopper says, I uh, would have never thought that the two guys who rate owl photos on a scale of one to five become the most credible source of information. <laughs> Keep up the great work. <laughs> no. <laughs> Obviously, Can we I give a one, know what we're talking one star about. for that? <laughs> I think we're beyond a one star. We're like a two to three. Like yeah. we're Don't put it in your portfolio, but we're making content. Um, all right, here's an interesting video. It's not that interesting, but... You know, we've been talking about how the economy is going to be doing after we're released from lockdown and everything. And this was a quick little video clip, I think, from London. And the museums are worried. The museums are worried that without enough people paying to come see the stuff in the museums, that they will run out of money and they'll have to shut down museums. I think, without exaggerating at all, that the UK as a result of COVID-19 is looking at an absolute cultural bonfire. So, it's An absolute cultural bonfire. Institutions like Mary Rose are in absolute mortal peril and will not survive past the summer. It costs over £2 million a year to preserve the ship and all its artefacts. Costs which continue regardless of whether the museum is open to visitors or not. 
the collection is very, very fragile, and we have to keep it in, in the right temperature and humidity to ensure that it survives for another 500 years. This has had a new canvas put on the back of it. You can just see Simon that. Gillespie yeah, restores and cares for paintings all over the world and fears the crisis will force smaller galleries to take drastic measures. Some of the smaller museums are thinking about how they're going to support themselves and if they've got a painting that or a work of art that they think they could raise money, it's the easiest way of doing it, isn't it? That's their main, main asset. A recent survey showed that 29% of the public said they won't be returning to museums for a long time after they reopen, with 54% of people saying they won't return for a while, which will be devastating. I like how scientific that was. 25% a long time, 50% a while. So I don't know. I don't know if there's anything that you can really learn from that, but I think it just goes to show you how far reaching shutting down the economy for a couple of months and, you know, scaring everybody to death, what it can actually do. And uh, I've got another clip here from. I like, don't mean to cut you off, but for I love Hunter Anderson's comments. So what are they going to do? Throw the ship away? You know, and it's like well, some of this stuff, like I understand preserving art and at times living in a historic city like Charleston, I get a little cynical thinking like what is really good about certain historical things? Like what makes one thing historical right. and then another thing's historical, but it's like garbage. Like this is an eyesore just because it's I think Mike Kelly says this all the time. Just because it's old doesn't mean it's worth saving. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking like so many paintings and stuff like didn't they survive without air conditioning? <laughs> right. Like some of these things are thousands of years, like a thousand right, years old. Right, like or, that boat probably survived on the bottom of the ocean for yeah. hundreds of years, and they're like, we have to keep the humidity away from this wood. It's like, it was in the ocean. So, yeah. And it's not like it's going to be forever. Like, you don't get the proper funding, and the AC has to go up 10 degrees for, like, a year. Right. But then hopefully, like, <laughs> I guess they could lose the building and stuff, and it has to go into storage, but it has to be rebuilt. But everything you see is rebuilt. We went to Anchor Watt. All those temples were all destroyed. Every one of them was rebuilt. Like it's yeah, the... we were watching people rebuilding it while we were there. You know, with jackhammers, building the blocks and then putting them up. And I was like, oh, is this all fake? You know. Well, I think some of it is recreated, but I think a lot of it too was just it was knocked down and then they put it back the way they think it was using the original structures. Yeah. But so many things are like that where you know. We're talking about Dresden the other day. I mean, you go to places and it's like they rebuilt it after it was destroyed, but and it's historic, but that's not the original thing you're looking at. You go into the Vatican and you see the paintings, you know. We were just talking about the Michelangelo, uh, what's the one, the big Sistine Chapel. Sistine Chapel. It's historic, but the paint that you're seeing isn't the paint Michelangelo touched. I think it actually might be in that case. I don't know that they repainted They the relit Sistine that one? I think they just removed the ash from on really? top of it. Hmm. I think so. But of course, my favorite painting reconditioning of all time was the Jesus painting. Remember this a few years ago? I this woman who convinced this church. I got to pull this thing up. Uh, let's see. Jesus painting ruined. <laughs> this is like the most... <laughs> You remember this, right? No, I've never heard. What? No. This is the biggest story of the year. So this woman convinced this church that she could recondition paintings. How and so real? she took this and th <laughs> this is what she made. She painted on top of the one on the Yes. Wall? She was hired to recondition this painting and this is her finished product. An elderly woman in Spain says she unintentionally defaced it. Yes, she was, she was said that she was going to restore it. And what's awesome about all of this is no one gave a crap about this original painting at all. And after this woman ruined it, this painting became famous and people paid lots of money to come to this church no. to view it. Everybody loved it because it was so hilarious. So it ended up making a lot more money for the church. They got more donations. Yeah. You don't, I can't believe you don't remember this. People were dressing up like this painting for Halloween. 
I mean, this was Where's like, the date on this? Is this like 10 This or was a years long ago? time ago. Okay. It's probably before I cared uh, about the internet. Uh, 2012, okay. 8 years ago. But yeah, dude, this was like <laughs> I just remember crying tears when I saw this. This was like the funniest thing I'd ever seen. Well, Robbie Keane says, let the billionaires and millionaires support the museums. And part of me agrees with that. We went back to the, the article I was talking about how you could, uh, the podcast, about how you could invest in fine art. Yep. There's so many amazing artists that you'll never hear of that fall off the face of the earth. Their, their artwork is destroyed. Like, it, shouldn't the best artwork that's valued the most, not the best, but the artwork that's valued the most by the people... That's the ones that will be bought up and preserved. And if a couple, you know, if half the museums around the world go under because funding, we didn't, we as a society didn't find that worthy enough. It wasn't essential in an emergency situation. It's like it, it feels bad deep down inside because you're like, man, we preserved it and it was upheld and it was viewed as something worth seeing. But at some point, like, have you ever gone through like your house and you're like, I got to throw away stuff that I did when I was in fifth grade? And I'm not even sure that you'd have to throw it away. You'd put it up for auction and someone else would care for it for a while and right. then they'll die and it'll end up back in a museum one day. So, yeah, it's probably a fair way to Dude, look I, at things. Does sound too, like, yeah. dark about art? Yeah, you're an asshole. Um, so here's an interesting clip. In South Africa, during the lockdown, they have gone into full prohibition. No cigarettes, no alcohol. And remember, you remember Fox News was giving a lot of governors crap about this. Like, why are you allowing liquor, liquor stores, stores to, to be open, open, but hairdressers not to be open or whatever? Well, take a look at what happens when you take away alcohol from people. We think, unfortunately, that if the lockdown in South Africa continues towards the end of May, it will have a material structural impact we would probably lose 80 wineries. We think we will lose 300 producers uh, and 14,000 jobs. Twenty million bottles of beer down the drain. The South African government introduced its ban on the sale of alcohol and cigarettes for entirely logical, understandable reasons. But we're now many weeks into this lockdown and the unintended consequences of that ban are becoming more and more stark, more dramatic. In communities like this across South Africa, poorer communities in particular, people are struggling to put food on the table. And increasingly, people are turning to some very particular crimes to try to support themselves. The people is angry because the bottle store is locked down, doesn't open. Another shop is open, but the bottle store is not open. People are getting frustrated, are they? Yes. How many customers do you have at the moment? Uh, more, more than 40 a day. Wow. You're busy. Yes, I'm very busy. So basically, people are... Uh, oh, they're all bootlegging. Yeah. Right Same thing that happened in the States. Cigarettes are basically drugs now. Community now is take us like gangsters because we deal with big gangsters to get cigarettes. These people are quite scary, are they? Yes, they are very scary. They carry guns around, they can't trust anyone. I feel ashamed because it's not okay. Rather have a proper job. Exactly. It's funny because when you started this clip, I was thinking, oh, like, People will now be healthier and less people will be drunk and like it yeah. should help their society. But how foolish am I? Well, I mean, everyone I'm sure will that's find true. what they want. I mean, I'm from a percentage standpoint. Yeah, overall, I'm sure like, it is you healthier. Would, you would stop drinking. Yeah. But maybe I would go into the dark corners and find Absolutely. that bottle of booze and maybe you somebody's going to get stabbed. You'd for be it. working with the gangsters. Yeah. You'd be wheeling and dealing underground. So, from a percentage standpoint, less people would be partaking. But then from a violent standpoint, you know, it's, it's getting worse because you're... I mean, this is the argument for making marijuana legal. Yeah. Is if we could just make it legalized and, and have it in dispensaries where normal citizens are able to sell it, then we would cut down on all the crime. At least that's the theory. 
Yeah, and then the other thing, you know, just looking at all the jobs. You, you, you just think to yourself, like, oh, we don't need alcohol in a time of emergency or whatever, but it it's just seems so unfair to, you know, these wineries and beer manufacturers and liquor manufacturers. It's, what did they say? Like millions of bottles of beer they have to pour down the drain. That winery guy is, is thinking that 14,000 jobs in the wine industry will be destroyed. Uh, it's just crazy. I, I, I feel like people don't, they're unable to see past just the moment right in front of them, you know? And with wine, like, they can't continue to bottle it? Well, that's, yeah, I don't, I don't get that. And with the beer. I'm like, just bottle the beer I mean, and beer sell goes, it. Beer goes bad after time, but a lot of wines People get better. People say that. I remember when Katie and I got married, we had beer that we left in our garage under our house for how long? A year? I think it was longer than a year. But in the heat under our house it over was like a year. It was like Light and stuff. What's the point? I'm just saying it wasn't great beer to begin with to where you're like, oh my gosh, this beer tastes horrible. But my point is, is like if they could bottle it and sell it at 50% off or 75% off a couple months from now when people are let out, that seems better than just putting it down the drain, right? Yeah. I don't know what the answer is there. I think it goes to show, somebody left this in the comments too, just how many people need money. You have museums, you have, I mean, this is crazy because they're actually making it illegal to sell this stuff. Yeah. But everyone needs a bailout. Yep. And that's what's still so crazy about the futures, you know, all of the stock market. Like, if the, if the stock market's a reflection of where we will be soon, and there's hope and the market's going crazy, I just see all these stories and I'm like, what is going to happen to all these jobs? What's going to happen to all this property? What's going to happen to the way that we say, I mean... People are saving like crazy. Another article that uh, I couldn't find a video for that we could talk a little bit about, I put in the description, is... Um, don't you love it how every day, right before we go live, we're like, yeah, we, we don't really have much to talk about today. We've gone for an hour and a half already. I just hope people find it interesting, because sometimes <laughs> I feel like we talk about the same thing. I don't... Feel but like there's always, do. like, a nuance to I know, it from the I day. know. <laughs> this article that's in the description was basically saying that, what do you think are the top three ways that people spent their, uh, their stimulus money? I would hope on rent, food, and entertainment. Entertainment? Like, like television and internet and stuff like that. Utilities? Utilities, maybe. Well, click on... This one? Yeah. If you read the title, you already know I didn't what read the it. answer is, but just scroll down a little bit. Many Americans... Oh, what the hell is this? They want you to consent Turn to... Turn off my ad block. Many Americans use part of their coronavirus stimulus check to trade stocks. Okay, I did actually read... So scroll read. down, and it just shows you with a chart. Um, so right here. The number one thing people spent their money on by different age groups, or uh, I'm sorry, by income brackets, was uh, savings, which is good. Most people spend it on savings until you made $150,000 or more, and then you spend it on your loans. Uh, and then they, the second number one reason, or the second reason, was they just took out cash, cashed it and spent it in their communities, okay. or put it under their pillow. I don't know. That could be savings, too, I guess. We don't know. And then the third one for, I mean, the second one under 100000 was trade securities. And then the third one under 350000 to 75000 which is probably the majority of Americans, right? That's wait, like, wait, wait. What are you looking at right now? 350000 What? Look at the top chart. chart. If you made... 35000 If you made 350... If you made 35... Did I say that wrong? Yes. Okay. $35,000. To 50000 To 75000 those two. Okay, here. Yes. Home improvement. Well, that's the fourth one down. Sorry. <laughs> Security trades, 93%. Security trades, 90%. What, what does the uh, percent mean? Um, is that like an increase? Categories which saw highest week-over-week -week changes in bank account transfers from households which received stimulus checks compared to those who did not. So... I assume this says if you make thirty five thousand to fifty thousand, you had a basically one hundred percent growth in security trades. So you took that money and you opened up 
a trading account. Uh, I don't know about that. Well, that's what the other articles have been saying, that they have seen on these uh, stock trading sites that the number of accounts that have been opened have been insane. Hmm. But what you see people are not spending it on, they're not spending it on loans, home improvement, education, wait, wait, utilities. What do you mean they're not spending it on this? They are spending it on this. Well, the majority of the money is going towards savings. Most people are just holding on to the money for a rainy day, which is the wise thing to do. But then the next thing most people are doing is taking it out and just spending it and, and, and at least putting the money as cash, changing it to cash. Yeah, but home improvements at 93% is basically the same. Home improvements and security trades seem to be about the same percentage growth. I don't fully understand this chart. Um, does this mean that you... You spent 93% more than you normally would. That's how I understand it. Or you spent 93% of what you normally would, which would be a little less than normal. I think this means 193%. 193%. Like you spent oh, 93% more rather than 93% of what you normally spend. Well, if it was of, then it would all have... Would it all have to add up to 100? Yes, which it doesn't, because up here it's a yeah. plus 250%. Um, all right. But a lot of these articles have been saying, I, I just mentioned another one where, you know, these investing groups are saying, look at how many new accounts have been made. And it makes you wonder, like, we always joke about the Wall Street bets uh, culture in America. Yeah. And how, like, Wall Street bets, if you look at how many new people have joined that subreddit... It's like a hyperbole. Like, it's, it's <laughs> a hyperbola. It's like a crazy amount of people that have joined. And they uh. can, you look at all these stats, and you can look at, you know, Robinhood accounts and Fidelity accounts and, you know, any, any other account that you can invest in, and it's going up. So it just makes you wonder, are people feeling like this isn't a big deal, and I should take the money and put it in the market because maybe the market dipped, and I'm going to make a bunch of money on it. But that could be the most irresponsible thing you could do with a stimulus check. Our buddy uh, Brian, Brian Bowden is in the chat. He just left two bucks, but you squandered your two dollars, Brian, by not leaving a chat that we can actually read. How do you know that's him? JB Bowden, it's got to be him. What's, what's his middle name? Or what's was, his first name? I don't know what his first name is. Uh -oh. you, but, have a, you have a really good friend and you don't know his first name? I don't even know your middle name. But um, Brian has been telling me, we've been talking every few days for the last couple weeks or whatever, and he's like, tonight, bro, I'm watching the show. That's my impression of you, Brian. Tonight, bro, I'm watching the show. And totally, man. I'm... The next time we talk, he's like, tonight, tonight, bro, I'm watching the show. I don't even think he says bro, but... You would just throw that so in. So this is the first time ever. And then he was like, I'm going to send you a video tonight that you got to put in the show. And he literally sent it to me like 20 minutes ago. We were already an hour into the show, so he was super late. Um, the Charlie Papa says, I spent $2 on this super chat. Yes, you did. <laughs> yes, you did. Thank you very much. 420 Tindy says, Wall Street bets is not a joke. It's a lifestyle. So true. I was on the Reddit today for investing, and the title of it now was something like, uh, watching you and your friends lose money. Or on the something. investing subreddit? Yes. I always wow. thought investing was like a the legit. serious one. But yeah. even that has been converted. I'm like, there's nowhere to go for good information anymore. Bruce says, lottery tickets are not a joke. It's a lifestyle. So true. All right, let's watch this Peloton video. we got to wrap this whole show up here. Reports that fitness equipment sales were up 130% in March. Want to get your thoughts on Peloton, the growth we've seen uh, within that business and how sustainable it is going forward, especially given the fact that we're getting also getting reports of delivery backlogs. Yeah, um, so it's a, it's a good point. When we, when we think about uh, how uh, COVID-19 and the environment of the last couple months is changing things, uh, just overall behavior and certainly across our sector, uh, connected in-home fitness is, is one of the key areas. And uh, we've certainly seen it in Peloton numbers. Uh, certainly in 1Q and into 2Q as well. Uh, they just announced that they crossed more than a million connected fitness subscribers. So you're right, there is pretty substantial backlog there. Uh, I think if you go on the site now, you, you might see eight to nine weeks or somewhere in that range in terms of wait time for a bike. Um, but I'd put that in the category of, of good problem to have. 
uh, in terms of so much demand. And, uh, you know, since March, they've actually uh, doubled their, uh, you know, their supply, their ability to manufacture here. So they're making a lot of adjustments, speeding it up. Um, hopefully by July or August, they're able to uh, kind of catch up and really get that um, order to delivery window down. But this is a uh, sustainable type of behavior, a sustainable change in our view. We think it'll take time for people to go back into gyms and other fitness areas. And quite honestly, uh, in-home fitness will become more compelling uh, on the other side of the crisis. Now, I have to say, you gave your fiance a reject Peloton as a gift, right? Well, here in Puerto Rico, they will not ship many things to the island because it's just so expensive. And so I know what it's like to live in a family where people buy workout equipment and then it winds up like in your old bedroom that's now like a storage unit for <laughs> garbage. That My parents have had the Nordic Track. You remember that one? It's like the ski one. And then you had the, uh, the Bowflex, I think is what it's called. They've had all this stuff, the treadmills, all that junk. Yeah. And, like, they wind up not using it. Kristen loves to spin. And so for Christmas, I gave her a ring. But then I also gave her um, a bike from Amazon. It's like $250 bike or so. That's a good price. And uh, it would ship here. That was the hard part. So I got it here, and I was like, we'll see if she uses it. She uses that thing every day. Like, she's... It is a little weird to me that she doesn't just ride a bike. We have the most beautiful place in the world to ride a bike. And well, she... she's been doing the Peloton app yeah and she just loves hearing the music she loves watching the people and they like motivate you yeah. i don't think you can have that experience like i'm with you i would rather just bust my ass and ride around the neighborhood and that's my workout but a lot of people as we see like to sit there and have an instructor i mean have you, you've never been to these spin classes either have you i've never done a spin class no. i did one in charleston and it whooped my ass yeah oh yeah i hear that it was it was like the size of this room here i don't know like 30 by 30, this isn't 30 feet, but 30 by 30, 40 by 40. And, you know, they got the lights going and the instructor is there yelling at you and you're strapped in. Like, I don't like to be strapped into a bike where my, like, once I get off, it's like I'm about to eat it. And, man, everyone in there is just going full speed. And it was, for an hour, that's really difficult. Oh, yeah. And so I know why she likes it. Do you know how much a Peloton costs? I hear they're insanely expensive, but no, I don't know. $2,200 okay. for the bike. And then they do the subscription service. I think they've been doing it free for the last three months because of quarantine. Oh, wow. And now everyone's addicted to it. Do you know how much the uh, cost per month is? No. $40 per month. Brilliant. And they just said that they have a million subscribers. And that's a stock where, or a, no. not a stock, but like that's a business where I think if people are stuck at home, you're not going to go to the gym anytime soon, right? That's true, but you know, I, I would have to imagine every work, every workout piece of gear, you can saturate the market. But then once people like your parents go, you know what? We don't need a two thousand dollar piece of metal to hang towels on. Well, let's put this up on Facebook Marketplace for three hundred bucks. But that's the beauty with Peloton is they're not making all the money on the bikes. They have people who don't have the real Peloton bike that are subscribing to the classes. Yeah, and that's it's the, brilliant. It's the cool instructor, and it's not just biking. I think she's on Peloton with, like, resistance bands and push-ups. Like, they're doing huh. other stuff. Is it live by any chance? I mean, that would be pretty wild if it was live. I don't think it's live, but it might be, like, recorded. They have a schedule, so they have, like, 20 trainers. I'm, I, I probably don't have this all right, but there might be 20 trainers, and every week those trainers make a new video. And so then you start falling in love with a certain person. You're like, oh, Jenny's awesome because she does the rap hip-hop class that I love. And so you subscribe to these people, and then you're like, I got to sign up for the $40 a month because there's three people that I love their workouts. Yeah. And you might have the reject bike, but I don't know. Like, people were saying how Peloton was not going to survive after Christmas because yeah. it was insanely expensive. And now look at it. I mean, Peloton, since... Uh, it says it was 65% up year-to-date. 72% up in three months. Hmm. So it just makes me wonder, like, is Peloton the future? I mean, if you can get rich people to buy stuff, like, that's always the key to success. <laughs> you know, you just have to... I don't think you have to be rich, though, to, to do a $40 subscription, if that's your one splurge, and have just a stationary bike. I mean, we went, yeah. to, uh, we went to Joey Wright's house, 
his apartment, and he had the same setup. Now, he didn't have a Peloton bike. He had a real bike that he can go bike, and then he sets it on, like, this resistance thing, yeah. which was really cool. Yeah. It's, like, the best of both worlds. I know. You bike when you want. You bike all day. Yeah, as long as you're going to spend two grand on a bike, like, make it a real bike. Oh, yeah. And then it can do everything. Yeah, and then he had the full-blown TV. Like, he had a setup. He had, like, the TV and the, the AC blowing on. Like, he would just <laughs> go. Like, it's pretty awesome. Huh. Uh, and then the next one, we always try to wrap up the show with some stock stuff. Uh, I think Facebook, this, this is a few days old now, but I think Facebook is doing what I suspected. These big companies are starting to buy all these little companies at a discount. And their stock, I feel like, is just going to keep going up. Let's check it out. Right. Which is why, which is why this Giphy deal is going to get an outsized uh, amount of attention. But once again, it points to uh, the large starting to pick off uh, smaller players, maybe using them strategically within Instagram to, I don't know, take aim at Twitter. What does this mean, this move by Facebook today? Yeah, so I, so I think this acquisition today, while it's it's not really big in terms of overall dollars, uh, look, this is about competing for engagement time. Do you know what they paid for this? I think they paid four hundred million dollars, but I believe that they put up their business for sale bef like a few months ago, before COVID, for like six hundred million. So they saved thirty percent. How how does this work when their entire website is based on copyrighted material? What are the laws that allow you to make and share animated GIFs without... Is it like a new... Um... How? How is it new? It's literally a short clip from a copyrighted work. But you put text on it, or you you know, like the guy, the guy who's always checking out the new girl. I mean, that's like the biggest meme of all time, or like last year. Yeah. And you just change it for everything, yeah. or it's like the Hitler. That's vi a meme. The Hitler video. Maybe yeah. that's different, but yeah, that's what most of this is. Is it's memes and like little. These are animated gifs, short clips from movies and whatever. Some of them might have added they're text, not, but they're not, you can't just make this and. So it shows how out of touch we yeah, are. Yeah, you can make you can make them, but I'm saying that 99% of them are from copyrighted material. I just I don't know what the current laws are that allow this to happen. I think these are just shared so wildly across the internet that there's no way to hold anybody accountable for it. But yes, I, I understand that. But you would think that Giphy as a website would not be able to be sold like a Universal or a NBC would come at them and be like, oh, you just got $400 million? You owe us $50 million because 20% of your website is filled with our content. You know, you would just There's expect... probably some kind of consent form or uh, what, do you, what do you call it? Terms and conditions where they're not responsible for the material. Like, Jiffy's not selling the GIFs. Oh, you're going the Jiffy route. It's not Jiffy. the Giffy route. Giffy, Jiffy... They're not selling the GIFs. Yeah. They're selling the software behind it. What's the software? Um, it's like for making it's just the a server. The platform uh, more fun, more entertaining. Uh, yes, uh, you're right. I mean, there is kind of a, a battle that goes on for overall engagement time across users, um, across the social space. And I think with uh, Facebook in particular, they've obviously had a very strong relationship with the company um, prior till now. I think about 50% of the traffic actually comes from the Facebook family of apps, and a lot of that in particular coming from Instagram already. So it seems to make a lot of sense strategically, and uh, engagement on Facebook and the Facebook family continues to be very strong, and this should help it that much more. Doug, on a day where MPD group... Is that it? I can't remember what the rest of it is, but people are saying fair use, but they're not doing commentary on it. Yeah. That's but they're also not... not really using it commercially. Maybe you could argue their site is. Yeah. It's like their value is in this database that's made up of all of this stuff. Yeah. But I was reading a little more into this, and the way this is really working is that Facebook has bought this platform, and when you build a GIF on their platform, there is so much spyware and like cookies and tracking code in the back of what they've coded that what facebook is actually doing 
is Facebook has no way to know how much traffic and data is on TikTok, what is on uh, Snapchat, what is on all these other social medias because they, other platforms, because they don't have access to that. But buying this Trojan horse that is shared and published on all these other platforms, Facebook now has the intellectual code behind it. And they will be, it's like basically like saying we have put a tracking pixel on your website. Facebook has done that, like I said, through a Trojan horse. And so now they, the guy just said, half the traffic going to their site is from Facebook itself which means the other 50% is from companies not Facebook. So Facebook now is gonna have their fingers even in more of the web than they were before, which is just, it's like, it kind of goes back to search. It's like they're, what they're trying to compete with now is what Google has been doing for 20 years, 30 years. Hmm. Facebook is trying to be that next company and they're succeeding at it. And I think you're gonna see this with more large companies. They're gonna keep implementing more things that you know, spread their, their reach in different ways, and it all comes back down to advertising money. I don't know enough about Giphy and how it's used, but can you place ads in these things? Can you have stuff like a way to monetize that? Can you have little pop-ups that show up? I don't think so. I thought animated GIF was just this simple thing that was invented decades ago. I don't know. Logan asks, do Lee and Patrick consume weed? Why or why not? Do you have any interest in talking about illegal drugs right now, Patrick? I think we should probably not do that while we're broadcast on a public forum. Probably not. I don't smoke weed, though. I've heard about it. <laughs> um, next super chat. Mike says, "All I want, I want to see all of you, including Patrick and Lee, in the Zoom meeting. Mafuckas. I would like to. This is just so tiring being under these lights. Like I'm burning up. And I've already eaten, and it's late, and I feel like I have to... We need a better system in place, because people are like, babies are crying, and we're trying to figure out how to mute and stuff. It's just not the best system. I don't know what the best system is. And then be. when I join, I don't want to talk at all. I want to hear what everyone else has to say. I feel like I'm... What people don't realize is when you run a show like this, when you run a YouTube channel, we have to put so much energy out that, at least for me, when I get done with this, the last thing I want to do is continue that. You say that, but then you'll stay up till three in the morning. <laughs> but I'm, wind, I'm winding down. I'm, I'm winding watching. Down I'm watching for shows. Five hours. <laughs> I'm reading the internet. I am yeah. absorbing. I am not. Yes, you are consuming. If I had to go to a club right now or go be social in the neighborhood, if that was still a thing, I don't know that I even want to do that. It's just too much work. Philip says, "My wife says you should stop the show now. She's sick of me staying up late watching you. Also, she likes Patrick's hair. Shouldn't she like mine?" Patrick does have some pretty impressive hair, I must admit. Up here, right here, it's not so impressive. Yeah, what is what is your chest um, curly look it's like? It's like growing back, but it's still kind of patchy. So then maybe we can do this all over again? Is that the game plan? If people pay enough, Patrick will rip out any hair on his body. All right, I think that wraps up the show. You got anything else left to say, Pat? Um... Touche Films will be putting a link to the After Hours uh, Zoom. I think I actually pasted the link in the description. Double oh, check on that okay. for everybody. But last night, the owner of Red was in that, uh, that chat and was talking all about the industry. Apparently, he's talking about how Hollywood is starting to reopen up and some of the insides Well, of... damn it. We should have been in last night's show. <laughs> I was thinking, is there any chance that we, we need a whole new board? And I know you don't want to do that, but could 8K streaming be the future do we need a red let's just move to 4k next you don't want to just then... leapfrog that no no i do not 4k is next but... did we get through all the videos was there anything else no that was it that was it we had more to talk about than i thought all right guys thank you for watching we will see you tomorrow